Finally, I'm going to post a review of this great film that I got an early screening for. But first, champagne. Mm. Why champagne, you ask? Because that's what the film's about. What I'm drinking right now is the world's first blended rosé champagne from the Veuve Clicquot label. And the film in question is called Widow Clicquot. And it is about the very woman who invented this champagne. Let's get into it. The woman in question, Barb Nicole Ponsardin, that was her given name, marries a guy named Francois Clicquot. And Francois has a small wine business. Now, Francois is kind of like a gentle soul. It's clear from the film that he has some kind of mental health problem and he sort of struggles. He has mood swings. But the one thing he is dedicated to is his winery. And through his winery, he's really dedicated to his wife because his wife knows almost as much, if not more, about winemaking than he does. And they worked very collaboratively for the short time they were married to try to grow the best grape, you know, blend the best wine. They really, really wanted to produce a unique champagne that nobody had ever seen before. Tragically, though, when she's 27 years old, her husband dies. And she takes over the running of the vineyard. She's really smart, so she finally convinces her father-in-law, hey, you know, extend me a line of credit, loan me some money so I can keep the business afloat because this business meant everything to your son. And it would break his heart. He would like roll in his grave if this vineyard went out of business or if I sold to Moe, you know, Moe, the champagne guy, Moe Chandon, that guy. And from jump, Moe was trying to get that land. She had some really good grapes grown on that land. So the folks at Pixel Media who are marketing this film sent out early screening links to a lot of content creators who produce feminist content like I do. They really wanted to get a sense of what we thought of the film. And the first thing that struck me is this. So when she first takes over the vineyard, she meets with the manager. And he really, really does not like the idea that a woman is running this vineyard. And she kind of explains her working style, what she would like to see, how she wants the management to work, what kind of business she wants to have. She says, I have a lot of great ideas. You probably have great ideas. I wanna do some interesting things. I'm working on this rosé blend. And I really want this to be a very sort of collaborative leadership type business. And he looks at her and says this. Without hierarchy, there's just chaos. Chaos is a ladder. One of the things that patriarchy is obsessed with and that many men are obsessed with is the idea of hierarchy. Remember Jerry Seinfeld a few weeks ago? Lamenting over the fact that, oh, there's no agreed upon hierarchy anymore. You know, things don't make sense. This guy pulled a Jerry Seinfeld. He couldn't imagine a business without some kind of hierarchy. He couldn't imagine any kind of collaborative uh, business environment. So then she gets a visit from a mutual friend of hers and her husband's, a guy named Louis, and he is a wine distributor. And when they're having dinner, when he first visits her to taste the wine, she's telling him about her day and her talk with the vineyard manager. And she's explaining what he said to her when she was talking about working collaboratively. And he turns to her and goes, well, you know, something like, of course, that's what he would think. And he says, you know, to be a leader of a business, you have to be powerful. You have to project strength. And she says, so collaboration doesn't project strength. And he basically agrees. He says, it doesn't project power. So that whole obsession with hierarchy and power and how men can't even imagine a world where that hierarchy doesn't exist, that was very interesting. But the film goes on to tell the story about the origins of this very rosé that she ends up making successfully, and as I've already told you, it's delicious. But what made Barb Nicole successful? Like many business owners, she was able to think ahead and be two, three steps ahead of the competition. So once she perfected the rosé, Louis tasted it, he said, cool, great, I'm gonna sell this. Only one problem. What was going on in France in the early 1800s? Oh yeah, the Napoleonic Wars. So all the ports were blockaded and trade was at a near standstill. You couldn't get anything in or out of a French port. So good luck trying to sell your wine abroad if you know you can't get a ship out of the port. So her and Louis come up with a plan. This is 1810, 1811. So we're getting very close to the time where the Napoleonic Wars are about to wrap up. And she believes that in a year or two, maybe 18 months, the war will be over and the ports will be opened. 
So they decide to send her rosé ahead to Amsterdam, store it in a warehouse. That way when the blockades are lifted, they can just put it on a boat and send it where it's gonna be and they'll be way ahead of the competition. So they send the wine away and then tragedy strikes. Because of the length of the journey, the mud, the, the rain, the weather, the shipment of champagne spoils. So she's devastated. She's invested all this money in it and she's way in the red and she can't figure out what she's gonna do. A couple weeks later, Louis flows back into town with some good news and a big bag of cash. Where'd he get the cash, you ask? Well, he proceeds to tell her that while most of the shipment of rosé was spoiled, eight bottles survived. So he took those eight bottles, put them in his saddlebag, and rode to St. Petersburg and gave them to his rich Russian friends. And they loved the champagne. They were obsessed with it, which I understand why, because did I mention? It's pretty fucking delicious. So the Russian connection was really her key to getting a foothold in the international marketing of her wine. The Tsar loved it so much that he was rumored to have said, this is the only drink I'll drink for the rest of my life. I will have no other liquor, I will have no other wine. In a few weeks, you know, Vaud Clicquot Rosé Champagne became the Tsar's entire personality. So by the time the blockade lifted, just as she suspected, she already had a lot of good buzz all over Europe going about her champagne because the Russians told anybody who would listen, this handful of nobles like, oh my God, you have to try this champagne, it's amazing. And that is the origins of this champagne house. So she does amazingly well. She perfects the rosé, makes another shipment. Very quickly, she gets it out, turns it around. She's going like gangbusters and something happens. The other champagne producers, all men of course, they take her to court because in 1804, the Napoleonic Code became effective. And in the Napoleonic Code, individual rights for women were stripped to much less than what they used to be. Women in France had more rights before 1804 than they did after. In particular, the Napoleonic Code strengthened the power that men had over the women in their family, their wives, their children, their sisters, their mothers, etc. And the law said that a woman was not allowed to run a business. And the provisions talking about the rights of women, or rather the lack of rights of women, weren't repealed until 1938. The husband owes his wife protection and the wife owes her husband obedience. Women could own property, but they couldn't enter into contracts. So even though they owned the property, they had no right to the money. They couldn't do anything on the property. They couldn't improve it. They could do nothing. They had zero control over any income that was coming in as a result of the property, even if they were the owner. But per the film, there's an exception to the rule. You can run a business if it was your husband's business and he passed away. So if you were a widow and the business was previously your husband's. Check and check, right? She should be fine. But no, uh, because she was kind of having a relationship with Louis, her wine distributor, they said that she was wantonly maintaining her widow status just so she could run a business. That she was really, you know, you know, she was fornicating with this man and she needs to get married, but the reason she doesn't is so she can keep running a business. So basically she was like cheating, taking advantage of a loophole, which leads to a really interesting scene towards the end of the film where Louis comes before the court and asks her to marry him and she says no. And he asks knowing that she's gonna say no. When she first gets the summons, it's really kind of interesting because there's a clip from the trailer that gives the accountant's reaction when she first gets the summons. Is this the plan all along? No, madame, it never occurred to them you would succeed. No, it wasn't their plan to sue her all along. They didn't think they would have to because they assumed that she would fail and they'd be able to swoop in and buy the land at a discount. But she didn't fail. And over 200 years later, you have this lovely champagne label. And in particular, let me tell you why her champagne was unique and how she was able to get it to market so quickly. The champagne making process is much more complicated than the regular wine making process. It requires something called double fermentation. So the grapes have sugar in them and then you add yeast and that's the first fermentation. So that produces the alcohol and carbon dioxide. So that's how it works to just get a regular glass of wine, a still glass of wine, right? But to make champagne, there's a separate step. So then they move on to the second fermentation where they just add more sugar. 
And this second infusion of sugar and that process is what creates the bubbles. So the first fermentation produces the alcohol, the second fermentation produces the bubbles because the byproduct is the air and the bottles are hermetically sealed. So there's no other place for the air to go. So you get bubbles, but then there's a problem. All the dead yeast just congeals like at the bottom of the bottle and it's disgusting and it makes the wine cloudy and everything and you have to remove it. But the way that they usually removed it took so long and also agitated the bubbles too much so it affected the quality of the champagne. So she figured out a way to get rid of the dead yeast without over agitating the bubbles, the riddling process. She built the first riddling table. They take the bottles of champagne after the second fermentation, they turn them upside down and they rotate them slightly uh, every now and then for a few days, I think. The sediment, the dead yeast collects in the neck of the bottle and then it's more easily removed. This made the champagne making process much easier. This revolutionary technique meant that she could make champagne a lot faster than her competitors and therefore get it to market faster than her competitors. And by the way, it took Moet and all those guys like a couple extra decades after to figure out the riddling thing. And now it's basically how all champagnes and sparkling wines are made. So yeah, first blended rosé also figured out how to make it fast, nice and clear and beautiful without uh, all the weird dead yeast in the bottom. So I really like the film a lot because we rarely hear these stories about female entrepreneurs and we are led to believe by both men in our government and men on the internet that women didn't build anything. Women didn't make anything. Every time the conversation goes into, you know, like women don't need men, the men are always like, well, of course you need us because we invented everything you're using. We invented the phone you're using to type on. We invented, we, we built houses. We invented all the stuff. No, they didn't. They didn't invent everything. They didn't build everything. There were women that built things, important things, but we never hear about them. Most of them were just lost to history. So every time the culture unearths another one of these stories, I'm here for it, especially if it involves pink champagne. That's the film. So every time you drink champagne or even sparkling wine, I want you to think of Madame Clicquot and this wonderful New Year's Eve anniversary, wedding, graduation party experience of lovely champagne that you're having with your friends and family, that experience was brought to you by a woman. Cheers. To Bob Nicole Ponsardin Clicquot, the badass of the champagne industry. Get it, girl.